Thank you for tuning into Tag Church here in Little Rock, Arkansas. We pray that this message will truly be a blessing to you today. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so by visiting us at www.tagchurch.net. Also, if you have any prayer requests, please don't hesitate to send them to the email request on your screen. We would love to partner with you in prayer. Now, I hope you are ready for a word from the Lord today. Let's get right into it, and God bless you. The preaching of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. How many of you know there's power in His Word? Amen? So, Father, today as we transition from a time of worship into a time of hearing what you would say to us today, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would illuminate the Word of God, that today your Word would become light to our souls. And Father, I pray for any person today that is entering this Christmas season and they're not sure, maybe they're not even sure if they were to die today where they would spend eternity. I pray that no one leaves this place without the certainty and without faith that Jesus Christ has come, that he was born of a virgin and he died on a cross to save us and he rose again. I pray everyone leaves here with more than just the knowledge of that, but with the experience of an encounter with you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. This Christmas season, we've been looking at what came into our world when Christ was born. Two weeks ago, Pastor Dennis kicked off this series. He didn't even know it was a series, but it just became a series. He kicked off this series by talking about how when Christ came into this world, light was born. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says, In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How many of you know the darkness cannot overcome the light that came into this world 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born. Last Sunday, I preached on a thrill of hope, and we looked at how when Jesus came into the world, he brought hope, and he brought peace and joy. We looked at Romans chapter 15 and verse number 13, which says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And last Sunday, God met us in in this altar. How many of you were here had a powerful altar call where the thrill of hope was imparted back into believers' lives? And today, week number three, I'm going to be preaching on the wonders of His love. We sang our first song this morning, Joy to the World. I think it's verse three that repeats the wonders of His love. And our text is Ephesians chapter three. Look at it with me, beginning in verse number 14. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes and he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul's right there. That is why Jesus came. Emmanuel, God who dwells with us. Jesus came to live in you. Yes, He came to dwell in us. So Paul, writing to the believers at Ephesus, he says here that God through Christ may dwell in your hearts, verse 17, through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend. Everybody say comprehend. 
Now what we're reading here is actually Paul's prayer for the believers in Ephesus and Paul's prayer for you and for me. And Paul is praying here in verse number 18 that you and I will be able to comprehend something. We're going to look at that here in just a moment. He says, I pray that you have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the height and the depth and to know, everybody say to know. So Paul says, I'm not only praying that you're able to comprehend the width and the height and the depth, I'm also praying that you are able to know, verse 19, look at it, to know what? The love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now, that's an interesting prayer. What he's saying in this prayer to the Father is, Lord, I'm praying for these believers that they're able to know how much you love them, even though knowing it is something that surpasses their ability to know. It's almost like he's praying for a miracle because what he's saying is it's impossible to ever comprehend or to ever know the love of God, but I pray that somehow you will help them comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ. Look at it, verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How in the world do we ever begin to even comprehend the wonders of God's love? The Apostle's prayer, the Apostle Paul's prayer is that we, you and me, would have strength to comprehend the width, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So first and foremost, we must understand this morning, Tag Church, that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. Knowledge. Could we just do a time out in this service and think for a moment how much God loves us? Come on, I want you to just begin to think how much God loves you, how much He saved you from, how far He had to go to reach you. Am I talking to anybody who's been saved because of the love of Christ? You know, if you will just allow your mind for a moment to go there, your brain will begin to hurt because when I begin to think how much He loves me, even when I was unlovable, even when I didn't love Him back, even when I rebelled, even when I I continue to trespass, even when I continue to take my own path, yet he loved me with a love that is without restriction, a love that I could never outrun. We sing about the reckless love of God from time to time. As I begin to think about that, my brain cells start dying by the millions, praise God, because I cannot begin to even comprehend how much he loves me. Now, maybe you you're a little holier than I am, and maybe you're a little more sanctified, but for me, it is amazing, it is a wonder that God would love me the way he loves me. Come on, somebody shout yes if you are a recipient of his love. So how can we comprehend the love of God? And how can we know this love that surpasses knowledge? Well, I believe the only way that we can comprehend a love or to know a love that is not uh, knowable is it must be a love that we not just know about, but that we experience. Come on, somebody. You know, there's some things that you're taught in life by experience and not in a classroom through an instructor, right? There's just some things you can't learn. I, I mean, there's a lot of things you can know. I can know that inside this bottle of water that there is uh, H2O. That's, that, that's the scientific uh, uh, formula for water. H2O, it's hydrogen, two parts oxygen, and uh, I can know that, but until I'm able to drink it on a hot summer day when I'm thirsty, uh, my knowledge is useless. I can tell you today, you can know that God loved you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross, but until you've encountered the love of Jesus, 
us and experience his grace when you were lost as a goose. There's a difference in knowing something and experiencing something. Am I preaching to anybody this morning who have experienced the love of a Savior? So today, our prayer is that we gain this knowledge by experience. So Paul talks about four things here that he wants us to comprehend. The first thing is he desires, his prayer for you and I, is that we would comprehend the width of God's love. If you're writing, taking notes, number one, the width of God's love. You know, there's something I know about every person in this room And that is, every one of you, including me, we have limits to our love. We have limits. In other words, we can only love to so far. We have a limit in the width of our love. Now, there's a lot of you. Your limit is way out there. My wife is a lover of all people. That's why she married me. I mean, if she didn't have great love for people, right? I mean, this, this girl right here, she just, I don't, she just loves, 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 loves. She's the one that's going to give money to the people at the red light when every other car before them gave money. And I'm over there going, all they're going to do is buy booze with it. You're just enabling. And she's like, well, we don't know that. Let's let God judge that. And she's handing money out, granola bars out. And I'm like, don't hand that Kit Kat. Amen. Break me a part of that Kit Kat bar before you hand that out. My wife's one, if she goes to McDonald's, McDonald's and they have a deal where it's buy one get one free on the McDonald's app she's going to buy her a biscuit and then take the other biscuit and give it to somebody else because her love I mean it's way out there but there is a limit to her love and as I'm looking around this room I'm seeing people who love a lot and a lot of you in this room you need to learn to love a little better come on don't don't elbow your neighbor too hard this morning don't they'll be careful there amen but you know there's a limit to our love I thought I knew what love was until my first daughter was born. When Haven came into this world, it was, it was an interesting afternoon. I was a nervous wreck. I was already late because a train stopped on the train track and I couldn't get across and they had to come and separate the train and I run into the room. We were youth pastors and our teenagers were there before I got there. I mean, our worship leader was sitting on the bed serenading Crystal with a guitar. and I got all wrapped up in the IV stuff. I was so nervous. One time I walked off and I had her IV wrapped around my arm and it came with me. Jerked it right out of her arm through that machine across the room. She finally said, would you just sit down. Instead of me, I went to the Lamaze classes. I was ready to teach her to go, and all the stuff you were supposed to do, she was telling me to breathe. (laughs) But then at 1 p.m. on July 13, 2005, Haven Nicole Maynard came into this world, and all of a sudden, I realized I could love somebody that I've never been able to love like you love a child. Come on, am I preaching to any parents today? And I loved Haven. She was about four years old when Macy was born, and I felt sorry for Macy. I felt so sorry because I thought, there's no way I can love my second child as much as I love my first child. I really was feeling bad. I thought, this is not right. I'm going to love Haven so much, and then Macy, I'm just going to be like, ah, oh, that second little brat kid, you know. And uh, But how many of you know when Macy came into the world on September 4th, 2009, there was a love that you can't explain, you can't be taught it, you can only experience it. I want you to know there's some things that I'll never do for your kids, but there's nothing I'll never do for my own kids because our love has limits. I mean, don't look at me self-righteous this morning. Come on, somebody. This ain't no Presbyterian church. You got neighbors like I got neighbors. And I got some neighbors I'll bring over and I'll smoke some ribs. And I'll love having them at my dinner table. But then I got other neighbors. They ain't coming over. I ain't wasting my ribs on you or my Friday night on you. Come on, don't, I said don't look at me with that self-righteous attitude. Yeah, because our love really does have limits. I mean, I love you, but there's just some things that I won't do for you. And there's just some things you won't do for me, no matter how much you love me. I guess Meatloaf said it best. I would do anything for love, but I won't. 
Oh, y'all know that song too, huh? I don't even know what that means, but that was before my time. I'm sorry. Yes, it was. So as humans, our love for one another is limited. Somebody shout limited. But not God's love. The width of God's love is eternal. It's never ending. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. He says there is no longer Greek nor Jew. There's no longer circumcised nor uncircumcised. Slave or free. But Christ all in all. In other words, what he was saying is God's love isn't restricted. It doesn't have limits. It won't save this color but not save this color color. It won't save this social status, but not that social status. It's available to save every human being, praise God. You know, it's Christmas time, and there's a lot of scriptures, excuse me just a minute. There are a lot of scriptures and passages that I could preach this morning during this Christmas season, I could, I could reference the passage of the angels. And I could reference the passage of the shepherds there in the manger scene or out on the field. I could, I could reference the wise men. I could preach on the stable and the manger. The kids did that with their song this morning. But my favorite, I guess, Christmas scripture of all, above the Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2, all of them, I think my favorite Christmas scripture is actually found in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, and it's this one verse in that chapter. It's verse number 16. Anybody familiar with John? I thought you might know John 3, 16. I mean, if you could ever take the Christmas story and put it in a one sentence, you have it in John 3, 16. It goes like this. If you know it, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. How many of you love that verse? That verse starts with for God, kind of like the way the Bible starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't need to tell us where God came from because God didn't come from anywhere. and It didn't need to tell us God's beginning because God has no beginning. He is the beginning, yes? It doesn't need to tell us uh, the, the, the history of God because God's history, uh, the, 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 the God's history goes, uh, as, uh, you, you can't ever reach the beginning of God's history. It just assumes that all of us believe in God and it says in this verse that for God so loved, everybody say so loved. Say it again. Say it to the person on your left. Say it to the person on your right. It doesn't just say God loved you. It says that God so loved you. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Deuteronomy says, uh, I forget where, but in Deuteronomy, uh, it's, there's a verse that says, I loved you because I love you. I didn't love you because you, you did this or you did that or you didn't do that. No, I just loved you simply because I love you. What we learn about the love of God in the Old Testament and the New is that God's love is everlasting. God's love is unending. God's love has no beginning. God had no beginning, so His love has no beginning. All earthly love has a beginning, yes? There was a day that I didn't love Crystal, but then I can tell you the day that I fell in love with her. I, my love for her had a beginning. Every love Love that you and I know has a beginning, but God's love is just like who God is. It has no beginning, yes? And I'm going to tell you today that even long after this world falls and the last mountain crumbles into dust, the love of God will still be existent, reaching you and me. His love is His love is infinite. His love is unlimited. It is unbounded. It is unrestricted. I'm preaching this morning on the wonders of his love. So John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. The, 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 
the entire world. Most of you can't even love all your family, much less the whole world. I mean, some of you having difficulty loving the person sitting on the other side of the church this morning. You purposely went to this side because they were on that side. I don't know if I'm preaching prophetically or not, but it... Some of you, you can't, you can't even walk, or you can't even pass somebody at work without putting your nose up in the air, turning your head the other way because, because of your disgust for them. Some of you, you, I'm telling you, you out blowing your leaves into your neighbor's yard. Just bless them. Bless them, Jesus. Yes, oh, bless them. Bless them, Lord. Oh, it's get, oh I, I feel an anointing to preach this morning. Yes, amen. I'm telling you, some of us can't even, we can't even find a way to love our entire family, much less the entire world. But I want you to know today, God has found it possible because of the width of God's great love for us. God has found it possible to love every entire, I'm telling you, every individual that has ever been born on this earth, He has found it possible to love you in fight in spite of your faults, in spite of your stumblings, in spite of your rebellion. Come on, somebody. In spite of your shortcomings, in spite of your backsliding, in spite of our sin, God loves you. God loves the Jews, but he also loves the Gentiles. And the Russians and the Chinese and he loves the Arabs and he loves the Americans and he loves the French and he loves the Mexicans and he loves the Canadians. Why? Because God loves the whole world. God loves all colors of people. Red, yellow, black, and white are all precious in his sight. God loves the Pentecostals, but he also loves the Methodists and the Baptists and the Church of Christ and the Presbyterians. God loves preachers, but he also also loves murderers and he loves bartenders and he loves prostitutes and he loves homosexuals. I've come to tell somebody the wonders of his love can be experienced today. The width of God's love. The second thing that Paul prays for you and me to comprehend is the length of the love of God. Number two, the length of God's love. Now, this descriptive word used by Paul, the length, of God's love refers to time. Length refers to time. And what it means is that God's love is not something that's here today and gone tomorrow. You know, when I was a kid, I thought you had to get saved every Sunday night. Because I thought, you know, God loved me last Sunday, but he probably don't love me tonight because if he knew what I did this past week, you know, so I got to run to that altar and beg him to love me again. Can I tell you today, it don't matter what you do tomorrow. It don't matter where you go. It don't. Now, I'm not telling you you have a license to go do all of that, and I'll get there in just a moment. But what I'm saying, I don't care how bad you trip, how far you fall, the love of God is something that's going to be constant in your life. In other words, it's the same today as it is tomorrow. Preaching on the length of God's love. He loves us forever. He loves us throughout eternity. Look at this passage of Scripture with me in your Bibles or on the screen. Romans chapter number 8. I love this chapter. You've heard me say many times it's my favorite chapter in the Bible, which I know I say that about a lot of chapters and a lot of verses, but this one really is. Verse number 31. Look at it. Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son. There's another Christmas verse. He sent his son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all? All things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love 
of Christ. And then it goes through these things. Shall tribulation separate us from the love of Christ? Shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 36, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. The length of God's love. You know what stands out to me in those verses we just read? Is this phrase right here. He did not spare his own son. I have reflected on that this week. As I've just been anticipating today and sharing God's word with you today. And I just continue to reflect on those words. He did not spare his own son. It brings me back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. If you break it down, that he gave. Or Paul says in Romans, he did not spare his own son. You know, God owns everything. Amen. Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That means every hill. God didn't give the cattle on a thousand hills for you and for me. Come on, somebody. God, he, listen, God owns all the silver and gold in, in the universe. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't take a big chunk of gold floating out there in outer space somewhere to save you and me. No, 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 no. He gave his son. He gave his son. And he gave those words there in John 3, 16. They mean suffering. He gave means sacrifice. You know, we always think about the son's suffering and the son's sacrifice. And how great of a sacrifice that the son of God paid for you and for me. But could we just stop on this Christmas season, this Sunday morning, and think about together the, the suffering of the Father and the sacrifice of the Father. It was God who gave His Son. You know, He could have at any moment, He could have stopped it. You know, I want to I ask you, would you be able to stand in your house and look outside your window and watch a, a mob, an unruly mob, beat your child, beat your son, spit in his face, uh, 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 whip his back, would you be able to look out and see someone crucify, kill your own son if you had the ability to stop it in an infinity's uh, a second, in an infinity's notice, every in this place would stop it because our love has limits. We're not going to allow somebody to do that to our son. But the love of God is without limits. Yes, God could have stopped it at any moment. Jesus could have called down angels to stop it at any moment. But I'm telling you, the length of God's love this morning, the wonders of God's love, it didn't stop it because the reason he came was to be the sacrifice for our sin. Today I just think about how he did not spare his son. And there's somebody in this room today and you're living in sin and you're living away from God and you know that you are. I'm going to ask you to just reflect on how much God loves you. That he sent his son to die for you. His blood was shed to cover that sin that you're living in right now. And all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us are in need of a Savior today. The length of God's love, hear me today, church, it will go as far as it needs to go to reach you. I have parents come to me from time to time with teenage children or young adult children and they just say, Pastor, you've just got to pray for our son or our daughter. You won't believe what he's doing, what she's doing and how they're living. And I'm just, I'm heartbroken. These parents that are heartbroken and, and, and I pray with them and I give them encouragement and I give them verses and, and, and eventually I'll tell them this and I've told many of you this. I've said, listen to me. Your child cannot outrun the love of God. 
You just keep praying for them because God's going to get a hold of them. Now listen to me, child. If you're in the room or listening by live stream, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting your family. You're hurting your future because you may end up in a pig's pen before the Father's love ever gets a hold of you. Why don't you just, while you're sitting at Tag Church this morning, go ahead and surrender your heart and your life to Jesus before you get so far that it messes up your life. You'll never get so far where he can't reach you. You know, I want you to know, so often we think of the love of God as, you know, oh, the love of God. God just loves you the way you are. And God just, he just, you know, he just, he smiles on anything and everything. And you don't have to change. And you can be that way. And okay, you believe you were the born that way. Well, go ahead, live that way. Can I tell you right now, let me make this loud and clear. Nobody is born a homosexual. I want you to know today, nobody, don't listen to the science of the world today. But we are all born sinners and we all need to be born again if we're going to be saved but I want somebody to hear me today and hear me loud and clear as I preach to you this morning because I believe God's going to speak to somebody right here right now in this room in this Christmas season are you listening say amen we always many people think of the love of God as just this license to sin and just do whatever you want to do but can I tell you today that the love of God sometimes reaches us through the arm of discipline and chastisement. Come on, am I talking to any parents today? Am I talking to any parents who believe in whipping that belt off of your waist and letting it make a sound as it flies through them loop? Okay, maybe some of you are anti that, and that's okay. Uh, Listen, My parents stuck my nose in a corner. I had to stand with the nose in the corner. My kids think they got it bad because they got to go lay on their bed for 15 minutes. I had to stick my nose in a corner. Many times my dad took his belt off and whooped me. We was talking a few of us the other day about how, uh, in a group of people, about how many of you got, got, got paddled uh, by the principal growing up. And every one of them in that group, some of y'all were there. Everyone, yeah, I got paddled, I got paddled, I got paddled. I said, I never got paddled. They said, oh, you must have been the good boy. I didn't get paddled at school because I got paddled at home. Come on, somebody. I got whooped. Uh, we didn't do spankings. We got whoopings, right? Got whoopings. And, you know, my dad, bless his heart, he'd whoop the fire out of me. I mean, and I'm telling you, he'd whoop whatever got in the way. If you want to put your hands back there, them hands getting whooped. Amen. You want to flop over like a fish, you getting whooped on the left side and the right side. Front side, back side, it don't matter. That belt's a flying and you getting whooped. That's what's wrong with a lot of our families in America today. We quit whooping. Quit whooping them kids. By the way, I'm preaching the Bible. It says spare the rod. Spo- oh, y'all. Oh, y'all, y'all know that one more than John 3, 16. Earlier, I'm like, for God so loved you know, the world. I just said, spare the rust. Bless God. My dad whooped the fire out of me, leave me in that room crying for a few minutes. Then he'd come back, and he'd sit down there on the bed by me. And he'd, y'all know what I'm going to say? He'd say, son, this hurts me more. One time he said that before he whooped me. I said, well, then hand me the belt and I'll whoop you. That didn't work out too well. But I know, I didn't know it then, but I know today that every whooping I got, every discipline I got, is because my parents loved me. They wanted me to make right choices. They wanted me to do the right thing. So the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. He leads us on paths of righteousness. And what I've learned about this shepherd that you and I are supposed to be following is if we ever get off the path of what? Of righteousness. The path of doing right. The path of living right. If we start taking our own paths, going our own way, the loving shepherd, he comes, he'll leave the 99, he'll come after that one that got off the path, he'll get you back on the path of righteousness. Now follow me, do what's right. If you leave again, he's a loving shepherd. He comes back again, and and what does he do? He comes back, and he gets you again. Amen. And uh, and he gets you back on the path. Third time, fourth time, maybe 163 times. Every time you get off the path, he comes, he takes that staff. 
he brings you back in because he loves you. But there comes a point where the shepherd has enough with the sheep wandering off on their own paths. We've been to Israel, what, four or five times, and every time we see shepherds and we see sheep and we see goats. Even to this day, they're out there on the hillside, the Judean wilderness, and they're wandering around out there. And, and I've learned this firsthand from a shepherd in Israel, and that is this. When a, when a shepherd finally has enough of that sheep going off, going astray, and doing his own thing, the shepherd will come and he will break one of the legs of that little lamb. He will break the lamb so the lamb can't do it again. And then you've probably seen paintings and pictures of what I'm about to describe to you where then the shepherd will take the lamb and he'll put it up over his shoulders, okay? And he'll put that little lamb's head right here next to his heart. So as the shepherd continues to lead the sheep, that lamb around the shepherd's neck can begin to heal from the break that the shepherd made because of his wandering. And he brings him close and he sings to him and he loves on him. This is the moment where he's saying, oh, this hurt me more than it hurt you, okay? Because it did. Are you hearing me today, friend? The love of God may break your leg if you don't stop wandering off. The love of God may get you into a place where you lose everything. The love of God may discipline you. It may chastise you. But don't ever for once think that just because you're being disciplined, God doesn't love you. It could be that discipline that God's trying to save you. And anytime he chastises you, he'll put you up around him his neck and he'll hold you close oh hallelujah you got that verse Hebrews chapter 12 put that up there just so I can put some Bible behind this verse number 5 says and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons how many sons and daughters of God do I have in the room today so you understand you can't discipline other people's kids you can only discipline your own you might end up in jail discipline someone else's kids. You might end up in jail disciplining your own today. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, if Jay and Jamie bring Bailey over to spend the night with Macy, and Jay says to me, listen, if she gets out of hand, whoop her. I'm not whooping her. I'm calling Jay, come pick this demon possessed. Just kidding. Get this kid. Amen. I ain't whooping your kid. Okay, y'all following me? You can only discipline your sons and your daughters. This verse sets up everything else we're about to read because you need to understand if you're ever going through discipline by God, it is because you are his child. It's not because you've gone so far you're not his child anymore. It's because you are his child. He only disciplines his sons. Look on. It says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Everybody say that verse with me. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And if you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and you're not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, last verse, all discipline. Discipline seems painful. Listen to that. For the moment, all discipline. I'm, I'm telling you, when you get in your rear end, whooped, it hurts. For the moment, it hurts. But look at it. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of what? Of what? He leads me on paths of righteousness. It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So this little love of God and, oh, you know, somebody, somebody, you know, g g you know got, they're out there on their own doing their own thing. And, you know, oh, just we just want to lovey, lovey, lovey and just, you know, huggy, huggy, huggy. And we're seeing them. We're seeing all hell break loose and we're seeing them go through discipline. Understand what they're going through is because God loves them. That's why I wanted to say to some of you, go ahead and get saved today. 
before you have to face the discipline. Come on, somebody. Talking to us today about the length of God's love. Number three is the height of God's love. Write it down, the height of God's love. The height of God's love. Now I want you to just imagine, we're going to take a trip together, okay? Imagine getting into the fastest jet on the earth with me. Now I'm going to, I'm going to fly it, okay? No, oh, y'all don't want to get in now or something? All right, I, I'm in the pilot seat. Steve's in the co-pilot seat, so we've got a backup, amen. We are in the fastest jet on the earth. Last time I checked, I could be wrong, but I believe it was the SR-71 Blackbird. It can reach speeds, listen to this, of up to 2,100 miles per hour. Almost hard to even fathom that. Now, I want, you to, I want you to use your imagination a little bit more. And let's just say that that, that blackbird that can reach speeds of up to 2,100 miles per hour, let's just pretend together that now that jet can reach speeds 100 times that, which would be what? 210,000 miles per hour. So we're in a jet. You all are strapped in. I'm the pilot. And we are about to go into space. At 210, again, the fastest jet, 2,100 miles max, but we're using our imagination, multiplying it by 100, so we're traveling at a speed of 210,000 miles an hour. We're headed to the moon. It would take us to get to the moon in this jet, using our imagination, that can go how, fa how fast? 210,000 miles per hour. It would take us a little over one hour to get to the moon. Now that's pretty fast compared to today's space travel, which takes a little over three days to make a trip to the moon. Apollo 16, it took about three or three days or so to get to the moon. Now, now I want us, uh, I want us to come back to Earth, and now let's take a trip to Mars. Anybody ever been to Mars? I'm not talking about the candy bar, the Milky Way, any of those things, okay? I'm talking about Mars out there somewhere, the closest planet to the Earth here. We're going to take a trip to Mars again, going at an impossible speed of 210,000 miles per hour. Guess how long it would take us to get to Mars at that speed? It would take us 46 days to get to Mars. Okay. We got bored on Mars. I can see by the crowd. Nothing going on on Mars. So let's go to that. What's that? What's that? Uh, the one that got the ring around the planet? Oh, yeah, Saturn. Y'all know, okay. So now we're going to take a trip to Saturn. Guess how long it would take us to get to Saturn? Again, going 210,000 miles per hour. It would take you 195 days without bathroom stops, without breaks. Come on, somebody. Without convenience stores, without stopping and getting some M&Ms on the way. 125, 195 days. If you got in a modern-day spacecraft that didn't go 210,000 uh, miles per hour and you wanted to take a trip to Saturn, it would take you a little over eight years to get there. In a modern day aircraft. Anybody blown away yet? All right, let's go a little further. What about Pluto? Now, when I was a kid, Pluto was a planet. I don't know what happened to Pluto between when I was a kid and today. Now, I don't even know what Pluto is. But evidently, it's not a planet. So at our super speed of 210,000 miles per hour, it would take us 644 days to get to Pluto. Now the reason I times our speed by 100 is because we can kind of understand 644 days. But on a modern aircraft, I don't even think we could begin to understand it. If you were to go outside and, and tonight, today, whenever, you were to look up into the sky as far as your eye could see and you were trying to find the closest star to our sun. If you were to try to find the closest star to the sun, the name of it, I'll probably say it wrong, it's something like this, Proxima Centauri, something like that. How many of you think that would be a cool thing to go see? Probably not. You might get burned up. I don't know. But, I mean, listen, I'm talking about the closest star to the sun, not the furthest, the closest star to the sun. I can't even begin to tell you how long of a trip it would take us to get to the closest star to the sun because our measuring unit just went from miles per hour to light years. Let me help you understand. In a normal spaceship, to get to the closest star to the sun, it would take you 
148,000 years. Well, that's four light years. I mean, we're talking about getting on a light beam and traveling all the way to this closest sun. Listen, it would take 26,000 light years to get to the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. 26,000 light years. Well, if you do the math, 26,000 light years in a modern spacecraft today would take you and me over 4 billion years to get to the center of our own neighborhood. Anybody wild yet? Or shall I keep going? You know, when I was a kid, they told me there were 100 billion galaxies. I mean, we can't even get our mind wrapped around the one we live in. I mean, we're talking about just to take a trip from Earth to the center of our neighborhood is going to take us 4 billion years. We can't even begin to wrap our mind around something like that. But then when I was a kid, they said to us in science class that there are 100 billion galaxies. And then I think by the time I got out of high school or maybe college, they had already doubled that. And they said, no, actually we were wrong. There are 200 billion galaxies like the Milky Way, 200 billion. If any of you were to Google right now how many galaxies are there, Today, the scientific knowledge of galaxies out there in our, in our universe, they say there are over 2 trillion galaxies. Just in my lifetime, it went from 100 billion to 2 trillion. Pastor, what are you trying to say to us? What I'm trying to say to us today is we are talking about an infin infinity of outer space out there. Infinity means to have no known limits or no known boundaries. Infinity and beyond. I know that's going through your head. If you were to go and purchase the largest, most expensive space telescope, which is the James Webb Telescope 2021 model, which, by the way, that model would cost you $10 billion. So if you got any extra change laying around, don't buy the telescope. Give it to Speed the Light, BGMC, One Hope. Yes, amen. Uh, pay your tithes on it, praise God. But if you have anything left and you want to buy that amazing $10 billion telescope, what you will discover when you look up into space is you will discover that, 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 that we serve an infinite God. We serve a powerful God. Scientists have mapped that there are one, they've mapped, in other words, it's, they, they've mapped these names, that there's one billion stars in our galaxy. But here's what they also say. They say we've mapped one billion stars in our galaxy, but that's only 1% of the stars in our galaxy. That means there's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. A few years ago, they discovered the smallest star in our galaxy. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. We used to sing that. Come on somebody I think not when it comes to this star it's about 600 light years away from planet earth it's about the size of Saturn I'm talking about the smallest star in our galaxy 600 light years away the size of Saturn this tiny star has a radius of 36,000 miles that's about nine times bigger than the planet that you and I live on called Earth. Oh, and the sun, yeah, that little ball of fire up there in space, that up in the sky, it is 864,000 miles wide. It's 109 times wider than the Earth. I remember asking my science teacher in sixth grade once, what if the sun fell out of the sky and hit the Earth? And he took, a, he took the chalkboard, yes, we, I'm, I'm from that day, and he took a piece of chalk and he drew this massive circle as big as he could and he said that's the sun and then over on this side of the chalkboard he put one tiny dot with his chalk and he said that's the earth does that answer your question and it did I'll never forget that but the sun is 100, 109 times wider than the earth and as we said there's a hundred billion stars just like the sun in our galaxy the Milky Way's galaxy radius I know this is a lot to take in I promise there's not a test when I get done preaching but if you were to measure the radius of the Milky Way galaxy 
galaxy. Hear it. It's 170,000, not miles, 170,000 light years. It's just hard to fathom just how far that is. If It would take 200,000 years to span the distance. If you were to get in a car and drive around our galaxy at 60 miles per hour, like many of you will get on the interstate and go home today, it would take you more than 2 trillion years just to circle our galaxy. Our galaxy is pretty big, but as I said earlier, there are over 2 trillion just like it out there. Can I borrow a phrase this morning from Douglas Adams when he said the universe is vastly, hugely, mind-boggling big. It's vastly, hugely, mind-boggling big. And I want you to know something today about the love of Christ. If you were to measure the length of it by getting into that SR-71 Blackbird and multiplying your speed by 100 miles per hour and take off going up, you will run out of fuel a trillion times a trillion times before you'll ever escape the length of God's love. I'm telling you, it's infinite. It is pretty big. It's vastly, hugely, mind-boggling big. Somebody give the Lord praise today. Because it was a lot to spit all that out. I said infinity means to have no known limits or boundaries. It's safe to say that God's love is infinite. God doesn't have limits to it. He has no boundaries. I always think, what is it attracts people to Jesus? Because how many of you know we need to be like Jesus? So if we want people to see Jesus in us, we've got to answer this question. What is it that attracts people to Jesus? Was it because he's a great scholar, a great teacher, a great rabbi? Maybe there's some around the world that are attracted to Jesus because of that. Is it because of his miracles? Sure, there were a lot that followed him when he was on this earth that followed him because of his miracles. And even today, maybe that's what attracts some. But for me, it's his love. It's his infinite, unbounded. It's his love without measure that attracts me to this Savior named Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. John chapter 1 that I referenced in our opening this morning. I'm going to hurry. John chapter 1. Listen to this. It's a, it's a, it's a Christmas passage. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. I just talked about space, and we know who created all of that. Because verse 3 says, All things were made through Him. And without Him, not anything was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, verse number 9 says, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me. He has no rival. He has no equal. Verse 16, For from him his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him Known. Finally, the depth of God's love. The depth of God's love. I can't give you a bunch of miles per hour and light years for going down. I'm talking depth. I, I don't have numbers this morning to tell you how many 
how far it is to the center of the earth's core, how long it would take you to get there if you started drilling this afternoon. I don't have any of that, but I can tell you that the depth of God's love will reach the deepest parts of your heart. There may be some dark spaces. There may be some dark outer spaces in your heart today. There may be some deep parts of your life that are hidden, maybe in secret. Maybe no one knows about your past or about your present except you and God. There may be some hiding places in your life, some pits of shame, some dark places of guilt that you won't even open up to God because you're ashamed. But I can tell you today that when the love of God goes deep into your heart and finds those pits of guilt and those pits of shame and those pits of sin, it brings the light of His love in. And it changes you for the better. And it changes you for eternity. The depths of God's love, I said earlier, it reaches the whosoevers of this world. For God, we've been breaking this verse down, so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever you know what whosoever means? It means all. Whosoever means everyone. It means all. Romans 3.23 says, For the wages, or, or it says, For all have sinned and fallen short. For all have sinned. Look down your row right now, all the way down. All the way down it. Everybody on your row has sinned. Everybody on your left, your right, the people in front of you, people sitting behind you, everybody watching by live stream. The preacher you're looking at this morning, your pastor, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God or the standards of God, the righteousness of God. But John says, for God so loved the world that whosoever, whosoever would believe. I'm preaching about the wonders of his love. Whosoever, anybody, no matter what you've done. No matter how far you have fallen, whosoever believeth in him, Jesus is the only way, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm closing this morning. Curtis, if you could put back our opening text of Ephesians 3, verse 18, or is that Rick? Curtis is on the... You both kind of, you know, got glasses and I want to close with what we opened with. Paul's prayer for you and me, for the Ephesians and for all believers. Yeah, started at 18. Verse 18, yeah. He prays that we may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And look how that verse ends. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Remember last week when I preached on hope and I talked about this This miracle of when God fills you with hope, you overflow with joy and peace. How many of you remember that? When you get so full of hope, you start sloshing out, and what you slosh out is joy and peace. So when we are are hopeful, everyone around us, when they encounter us, even on a bad day, they they just kind of, they get splashed on with a little bit of joy and a little bit of peace, and it makes people look at you and go, how in the world with what they're going through, how can they have so much hope, and how can they have so much joy and so much peace? Because of Christ who fills us to overflowing, that's how. Put that verse 19 up there again. He says the same thing here. He says here, I want you to be filled with this knowledge. I want you to be able to comprehend because whenever you experience this love that I'm talking about, you're going to be filled with the fullness 
of God. Why the fullness of God? Why not the fullness of joy or peace like it said last week? Why the fullness of God? Because the Bible says three little words here that are powerful. God is love. And when you get filled with the love of God, you get filled with the fullness of God. And just like last week, I took a bottle of water and I said, whenever, when, if, if I was to splash a little water out of here, guess what's coming out of here? Water's coming out of here because water's what's in here. Whatever's inside the container is what's going to come out whenever, listen to me, if, if, if you were to come up and shove me, I mean just shove me, or let's say I was to come up and shove you, just shove you across the room. You know, we're going to find out real quick what's inside of you. You're going to turn to me out of that shove, and you're either going to say, you fill in the blank. I ain't doing it for you. Or you're going to go, oh man, I love you. Jesus said you'll turn the other cheek. It's hard to live like Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. I'm about done, but don't, don't miss this. Whenever life shoves you, when pressures push you, when things come up against you, Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever's inside of you is what's going to come out. If I splash this bottle, if I shove this bottle, or if I drink out of this bottle, Coca-Cola's not coming out of it. Coffee's not coming out of it because that's not what's in it. Water's going to come out of it. And what this verse is saying, it's saying when life comes and shoves you and pushes you and troubles come and press on side of you, what's going to slosh out of you is the fullness of God. The love of God is going to slosh out of you and it's going to get on everybody around you. And I want you to know what this world needs this Christmas season is they just need a little bit of love. They need a little bit of the fullness of God. I want you to get up on your feet and if you're full with the love of God, if you're full with the fullness of God, I want you to slosh some of it out right now by giving Him praise. Come on, let it get on everybody else. Let the people around you get saturated because of the love that's pouring out of you. Let the people in front of you get saturated because of the love that's pouring out of you today. Come on somebody, if you've ever received his love, take about 30 seconds and praise him for it all over this room. So 1 John chapter 4 says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest, Christmas verse again, it was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to slosh out and love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. We are filled with the fullness of God. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He's given us of His Spirit, the fullness of His Spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Christmas, all through your Bible. Sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses, there's that whoever. Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. Come on, everybody, confess that. Jesus is the Son. I believe here it don't just mean confessing with your mouth. I believe it means confessing it with your life. Because we can know things, but until we live things, we haven't really comprehended or we really haven't got the knowledge of something that we could never get the knowledge of. 
whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God, verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Say that with me. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whatsoever, whosoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. Bow your head all over this room and close your eyes. Nobody looking around, please. Before I dismiss you today, I want to pray for you. And I want to ask before I pray for you, I want to know who I need to pray for today. I want to know who might be in this room this morning. And you would say, Pastor Dwayne, I'm ready to experience, not just know, but experience the wonders of his love today. Pastor Dwayne, I'm not saved, or maybe I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm not sure where I would spend eternity if I was to die today. I, I mean, I'm a good person. I'm not, I'm, not, 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 I'm not a bad person, but I recognize that my goodness and my works alone cannot save me, that, that I needed a Savior. I needed, I needed the Messiah. I needed the Son of God, and I needed need him today and I want to receive him. I, I want to invite him to come and, and fill me like that verse talked about. I, I, want to, I want to encounter his love and be full of him today and I, I'm ready to leave some things behind and I'm ready to follow after God today. If you're in this room with nobody looking around and you would say, Pastor Dwayne, that's me. I want you to pray with me today. I want you to pray for me today. I want you right now on the count of three. I want you to look at me and raise your hand up high. Look at me and raise your hand up high. When I make eye contact, you can put your hand back down. But I want to know, is there one today? The shepherd is going after the one this morning. He's got his staff reached out just for you. It's not by accident you're here today. It's not coincidence. I don't care who invited you or why you think you might be here. You're here because God loves you. You're here. God has set you up. God has your number. He has your address. Address. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows every thought. He, know, he knows everything. And that's why he designed today. He ordained today to be a day where you would be in his house and hear this message. To hear him simply say, I love you, child. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. And if I'm talking to you and you would say, pray for me, pastor. I want you to raise your hand, make eye contact with me, and put it right back down. Yes, yes. Who else today? Raise your hand up high. Raise it up high today. Raise it up high. Is there anyone else in this room? I'm not where I need to be today. I'm not where I need to be. Pray for me this morning. Yes, thank you. Yes, who else today? Raise your hand up high. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Hands are going up all over this building today. God knows where you're at. He sees right where you are. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for raising your hand today. And as heads are still bowed and as eyes are still closed and as no one is looking around, I'm going to ask you to do the second part of this, and that is I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to meet you in this altar, and you and everyone else that just raised your hand, I want you on the count of three to get out from where you're standing and come meet me right here. I'm telling you, God loves you so much. Don't miss this moment. He wants to save you today. Today, you're going to know that you know that you know that you are headed to heaven when you walk out of this room. So if you raise your hand right now on three, one, two, three, come right now. Come right now. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for coming right here. Come stand right up here in front of me. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, you can do so by clicking right here. And also, here is another message that will bless you. Just click right here. Thank you, and we pray that we will see you again here at Tag Church. God bless you.